Hey, welcome to Return of the King. This is a series where we're going chapter by chapter through the book of Revelation to see what the Bible really has to say about the end times and more importantly, what it has to say for us today. Hey, I'm Randy Bond. I've been a pastor for over 25 years, and this is a series that we've been going through with our church family, and we're excited that you're joining us today. Today, we're talking about Revelation chapter four and what an exciting chapter this is. This is John's vision of heaven. And this is where we get probably one of the fullest glimpses, certainly one of the longest glimpses uh, of heaven in the entire Bible. So this is really chapters four and five are two very significant chapters for our understanding of what heaven is really like. When you're thinking about heaven, you probably have a lot of different ideas You've heard different things. You've kind of imagined what heaven is like. And today we're going to get a, a sneak peek, if you will, at to what heaven is actually like and what the most important things in heaven really are. Uh, so I'm glad you're, there, you're joining us today. And I hope that this will be um, a very helpful uh, episode for you. And I'm so glad that you're joining us. Uh, when we're turning the page now to Revelation chapter 4, uh, Revelation is kind of beginning a, a whole new section. Uh, chapters 4 through about chapter 16 is really one big unit. In chapters 4, 5, and 6 are going to set the stage for that. Uh, Revelation chapter 4, uh, we see the throne of God. Uh, Revelation chapter 5, we see the Lamb of God. And then in Revelation chapter 6, we see the scroll of destiny, as it's called. And this is where those seven seals of Revelation are talked about. All those are very important, and this is laying a, a significant uh, a foundation for us for the remainder of the book of Revelation. So a uh, great chapter to be jumping in on today. Uh, so Revelation chapter 4, uh, starting in verse 1, let's dig into God's Word together and see what it has to say. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, by the way. Uh, you follow along in your translation if you like, uh, but I typically use the ESV. Uh, so starting in Revelation 4, 1, this is what the Word of the Lord says. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Cornelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that, that had the appearance of an emerald. Uh, so uh, we are getting a glimpse now into John's vision. Uh, we're going to stop right there in the, the reading, uh, but we're going to catch a glimpse of what heaven is really like here. And uh, as we go through this, if you have any questions or comments along the way, uh, you can just drop those in the section below. And certainly within the first few days of uh, these episodes dropping, if you've got any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer those. And if you have any insight, uh, let's study this together and see if we can't be iron sharpening iron to each other and help each other out with some insight on Revelation chapter four. Uh, but I'm so glad that you're watching today. And again, if you find anything helpful in this, I hope that you'll like and subscribe. Uh, it means a lot to me. And by the way, we've hit a milestone. Uh, we have crossed the 500 subscriber mark, which is really incredible. Just uh, uh, less than two months ago is when this really began. And I've just been uh, very, very encouraged uh, to see uh, your response and to see uh, how the Lord has been growing this uh, uh, much more quickly than, than what I uh, ever really thought. Not that I was trying to do this to create a channel. Uh, my whole intent is to just have been to strengthen the body of Christ in any way uh, that I can. So thanks uh, if you're a subscriber. I really, really appreciate it. And if you're not yet and you want to follow more, I hope that you'll do that um, and just hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. You know the drill uh, so that you don't miss any of the others. We already have a lot of episodes on uh, Revelation already, and I uh, hope that you don't miss any of them. Look forward to hearing from you on your thoughts uh, as you go through. Uh, so let's uh, go back into Revelation 4, and, and here are our summary of the things that we see in, uh, in heaven in uh, Revelation chapter 4. Uh, the first thing that we see very clearly is the throne of God and God seated on it. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, this expression, the throne, is mentioned 12 times in this very short chapter. There's only 11 verses in uh, Revelation chapter 4, and the repeated 
word, the repeated phrase is the throne throughout. It's actually 14 times when you count the, the multiple thrones of the 24 elders. Uh, that's mentioned two additional times. So you get this real sense that um, the blatantly obvious focal point of Revelation 4 is God's throne. Uh, this is what uh, the, is um, the first thing that John sees. It is the, the attention grabbing aspect not just of John, but everyone in heaven. This is the significant focal point of heaven. Uh, we see God seated on the throne, uh, and he is brilliant. He's radiant. Uh, he's splendid in glory, like light from uh, precious stones. Uh, and it says that he uh, who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. Uh, and I don't think that he's intended to say that God was looking stony or rocky or anything like that. Uh, I think that as John is uh, simply given this description, um, this is so far different than anything that he's ever seen. And he's just trying to give, use some comparative language uh, so that we have at least a reference point. Now, I don't know what the most incredible thing is uh, that you've ever seen. And, and you can drop that in the comments below and let me know. For me, two of the most incredible things in nature that I've ever seen is number one, the Northern Lights uh, in Canada. And uh, the second was seven years ago, the first of the great American eclipses. Uh, my family and I drove uh, uh, six hours into the middle of uh, Missouri to, to be right in the totality of that. And I was not emotionally prepared for what was going to happen. It really brought me to tears. It was an emotional moment. Uh, because I'd never seen anything like that. And if, if you've never seen the Northern Lights, if you've never seen a, a total solar eclipse, and I'm not talking about being close, I'm talking about where the sky gets dark and you have the 360 rainbow around the horizon and you can see the corona uh, around. I can only use words like it was like this. And this is what John is experiencing here because God is so different than anything on planet Earth that he cannot use just direct language to describe what God is like. And so um, we also see that his glory creates this rainbow or this halo effect around him. And it says that around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. So this is not your typical rainbow. Uh, this is one that seems to be only green, an emerald green, a beautiful deep green uh, in its color and appearance. So it's not like the prism of light that we would typically see uh, in the seven colors of the rainbow, not six. Uh, that's... Uh, a whole different rainbow that does not come from God. Uh, but the, the, uh, the natural rainbow is going to have the seven colors. This one seems to only have the one. Don't really know what the significance is of this, and there have been a number of different ideas. One of those may be that uh, it's just simply that, that reminder uh, of the rainbow from, uh, from Noah's time. Uh, literally, the word in Hebrew is bow, kind of like a warrior's bow, that God set his bow on the mantle of the sky uh, with the promise he would never hunt humanity uh, and destroy them in, a, in judgment with the flood again. Um, so maybe this is just that reminder here at the very beginning as we're seeing God, um, just a reminder that he is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. And that's an important thing because things are about to get really dark in the book of Revelation, and we need to be reminded before we walk into that darkness of who God really is, and that part of that reality is he's a promise-keeping God. He makes his promises, he keeps his promises, and that could be part of why we see this rainbow being included here. Um, but one of the things that we need to understand is that heaven is glorious and wonderful because God is there. Now, I say that because as a pastor, I've been to a lot of funerals, done way more funerals than I ever want to. And it, it's it's sad to me sometimes to hear people talking about heaven and how they envision it and so forth. Um, and, and you would almost think that God does not exist. And this is even among those who profess to be Christians. They'll talk about the place, that it's beautiful, it's green, it's grass, um, it's, it's lush, those kind of things. They'll talk about the people, uh, dead relatives, grandparents, parents, those who have gone on before. Um, and they may even talk about perfect health, uh, that you know the person that's passed on uh, was in really bad health, and now they're glad that they're in better health. Or maybe the person is in bad health, and uh, they're longing for that day. And so the focus is on the... Uh, the, the place, the people, and the, the perfect health, but it's n almost like the presence of God is an afterthought. But when we glimpse heaven here, it, God is far, far from being an afterthought. He is the focal thought 
in everyone's mind. And this is something that we need to etch in our hearts and minds because we can sometimes be idolatrous in our views and even functionally agnostic or atheistic if we're not careful, uh, that we just imagine the perfection of the place with not, without realizing what makes heaven what heaven is, is the very presence of God. Heaven is not uh, going to be better necessarily because people are there. Heaven is glorious because God is there. And, and so let that just kind of resonate deep down in your soul, because this is what we see all throughout uh, Revelation 4 and 5 and the rest of Scripture. Um, and we also see uh, this mention of around the throne was these lightnings and thunders and soundings and so forth. And this seems to be um, a, a symbolizing uh, his uh, his awe-inspiring and terrifying power, his strength. Uh, we see this also uh, in uh, Exodus uh, at Mount Sinai. When God appeared there on Mount Sinai, Exodus 19 records that on the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. And so there's certainly this aspect of God that he is uh, incredibly potently powerful, and that we don't have a weak God sitting on the throne. We have the Lord God Almighty uh, sitting on the throne. And so this is a reminder of his power, that it is terrifying. And number two, that maybe it's a reminder of his judgment, because part of what is going to be revealed throughout the rest of Revelation is his judgment on wicked humanity on planet Earth. Uh, so that's um, uh, one of the, the, the messengings coming out through the symbol uh, that John sees here. Now, notice in all of these descriptions, we are not told how God looks. There are no descriptions of his features. We're, we're told about his glory. Uh, we're told about uh, the, the radiance of his appearance, but we're not told about the features, eyes, nose, mouth, hands, anything like that. We're not told that he has long white hair or, or you know, all these different images that people have about what God has looked like. And I, and I think this is intentional uh, because we are idolaters at heart. And I think that if God had given or allowed John to give a description of what he looks like, you can well, well imagine that throughout history, we would have had artists and sculptors and everyone else trying to recreate that. I mean, you take the Shroud of Turin um, that, you know, is often believed to be the shroud that Jesus was buried in. And man, you know, the computer generated images and AI imaging that they have now trying to figure out what Jesus looked like. All the more, there's a curiosity for sure what God looks like. But that can lead to this idolatry that, that we naturally are inclined toward as humans. And I think this is why we do not see this. And uh, I'm going to, to do another kind of a part two of this Revelation 4, where we're talking about near-death experiences and the books related to that, uh, this heavenly tourism genre of uh, Christian literature. Um, and so uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in, 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 when we get to that episode. But just take note of that here. This is not the most important aspect. It's not what God looks like. It's who God is. He is all-powerful. He is on the throne. And nothing is going to remove him from that. Uh, so immediately in front of the throne, uh, we're introduced to another uh, person, and this is the Holy Spirit. Notice it says, before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, uh, which uh, are the seven spirits of God. Now, your translation may say lamps there, um, and, and so either one of those is an accurate translation. Uh, but in verse 5, we're told that there in front of the throne is the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, now, it's called the seven spirits of God, and this is kind of thrown some people. God does not have seven spirits. He has one Holy Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and so this is uh, maybe taken from Isaiah 11, 11, verse 2. It says, The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, uh, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. So if you really count these descriptors out, there's seven of them. So it's the spirit of Yahweh, the spirit of Jehovah, spirit of the Lord. So that's one. The spirit of wisdom, that's number two. The spirit of understanding, it's not specifically laid out there, but that's just kind of understood. 
Um, that's number three, the spirit of counsel. Four, five is the spirit of might, so the spirit of knowledge, and uh, the fear of the Lord. That would be number seven. Now, this is not saying that there's seven separate spirits for each of these um, uh, descriptors there. This is trying to indicate that the Holy Spirit is the possessor of all of these. He is all of these wrapped into one. Now, notice I use the word pronoun, the pronoun he. Uh, he is a person. He is not a thing. He's not an invisible force, uh, an impersonal force or anything like that. Uh, he is the third person of the Trinity. Go back to Revelation chapter one. You see that the Holy Spirit is one of those that sends greetings. It's the triune God that sends greetings. The, the Father sends greetings, the Spirit sends greetings, and the Son sends greetings. Um, the next thing that we see is something like a sea of glass. And that's verse six, and it's described like crystal. And this is also before the throne. Now, this may be a representation of his holiness, but I think this is probably a good point uh, to really catch something that is maybe subtle in here uh, in this whole chapter, uh, or really in chapters four and five, that if we're not careful, we could overlook. And it's a really cool thing. And that's the temple imagery that's here. Uh, we are seeing in a descriptive way the temple being laid out. Now, in Hebrews chapter 8, we're told that the temple on earth was really just a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things, uh, that this was not really the primary thing, but the primary thing is in heaven. Now, there is no description of a building, a, a temple building in heaven, uh, but heaven is sort of described in temple language, like this is the original and that what Moses was told to do in building the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, uh, that this was really just a copy. Uh, it's a shadow to point people to the reality of the heavenly temple. And so notice that when uh, he, he says that they serve as a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things for when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. So this was not something arbitrary uh, that uh, he was given to do, uh, that, that the temple was not just something that God thought, oh, it'll look cool this way, that this wasn't really intended to reflect the reality of heaven, what it is like. And this is um, kind of the, uh, the rough diagram of, of how the, the temple was laid out. This is more of Solomon's uh, or Herod's temple. And, and so uh, you have on the, the left over here, uh, the building itself, the building proper, uh, and some of you may remember this, is divided into two key places. The most inner part is called uh, the most holy place or the holy of holies. Uh, and when you go eastward, so the temple uh, faced toward the east, the next place that you come to is the holy place. Uh, and the holy place had three items in there. It had the altar of incense. It had the table of showbread, which had 12 loaves of bread on there. And then it had the golden lampstand. Now, when you come out, notice that there is this lava here, the sea of, of um, brass, uh, and also the, the altar. It's kind of interesting because in Revelation 4 and 5, all of these are described. So here's just a, another viewpoint here. Now, uh, notice you would be coming in if you were a worshiper, if you were a Jewish man back in the day in the time of Solomon's temple, uh, you would have been coming in to the, the court from the east. And you, your first act would have been uh, offering uh, your offering on the altar there. That was the big deal there. Uh, the priest, however, uh, had this lava over here, the sea. Uh, and in the sea, that's where they would do the ceremonial washing uh, before they would go in. Exodus tells us that they would offer, uh, the priests would offer for themselves and wash uh, before they went in so that they might not die. So this was the important part of what they did. They did not walk in uh, unwashed, that they had to have that ceremonial washing before they went into the holy place. So uh, if you remember from, um, from Luke uh, chapter one, uh, you have Zechariah the priest. He was able to go in and offer uh, the, uh, the, the, the prayers there uh, on the altar of incense because his lot was drawn, drawn. So this was not something that a priest would just randomly do. Uh, they were chosen by lot to go in. So this was a great privilege. Uh, and then notice that up the steps here is the Holy of Holies. Uh, we're going to come back to that. But this is where only the high priest could go and only once a year on the Day of Atonement. 
so this is going to be significant uh, as we look at Revelation 4 or 5. Let's go to the Holy of Holies. Uh, in the Holy of Holies, uh, some people may not be aware of this. They, uh, most people know uh, that the, the uh, uh, Ark of the Covenant was there. And on the Ark of the Covenant were the, the two cherubim with their wings touching. And they were looking down on the mercy seat, the top of uh, the Ark of the Covenant. And what a lot of people don't know, and there is a description of this, and, and we'll look at that in First Kings chapter 6, that in Solomon's temple, there were two very large, these were about eight, uh, 15 feet tall, uh, inside the Holy of Holies, and their wings also touched over that. Uh, and notice that later when we get into the, the rest of chapter 4, uh, one of the key uh, uh, people that populates uh, heaven are the four living creatures. We have the two big ones and the two small ones right there. Uh, these are, I think, a representation of the four living creatures that surround the throne of God. The Holy of Holies was kind of considered to be the throne room of God, uh, the representation of it on earth. And it, just like in heaven, is surrounded by the four living creatures. We'll come back out to the uh, inner court here or the holy place in just a moment. So notice in 1 Kings chapter 6, um, when Solomon was building the temple, says that he put the cherubim in the innermost part of the house, the Holy of Holies, and the wings of the cherubim were spread out so that a wing of one touched one wall and the wing of the other cherub touched the other wall and the wings of the two touched each other in the middle of the house. So here's just another artistic rendering of that where you have the high priest coming in uh, and he's got his uh, offering there. But notice that the, the Ark of the Covenant is there with the two cherubim. And above that are the two larger ones with the wings touching in the middle and then touching the walls on either side. Uh, so one, two, three, four living creatures kind of being represented there. Uh, so coming back out, uh, let's move into the holy place. Uh, this holy of holies there on the left. This is the holy place where the priest would go uh, uh, every day uh, in order to make the, the time of prayer and to change the, the, uh, the bread on the, the table of showbread there. Uh, you'll notice that there are five lampstands in uh, Solomon's temple. There were five on the north wall, five on the south wall. So there were 10 uh, inside there. In the tabernacle, I think there was only one, uh, which is rather significant. And it had seven lampstands on there. Uh, so this was uh, a, 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 the, the sacred place that only the priests could go at that point. Now, again, notice that um, there was something like a sea of glass uh, in 1 Kings 7, so again, we're talking about building of Solomon's temple. Hiram from Tyre was the craftsman who made a lot of the, the metal objects. And so it says that Hiram made the sea of cast metal. I can't help but think that what we're seeing in the sea is a representation of uh, the, the sea of glass. Uh, so the sea of glass is represented by the, the bronze lava, that, that bronze sea that was in Solomon's temple, that was in the tabernacle, that was in Herod's temple. And this was that place of ceremonial cleansing. So I think it's that, that idea of the holiness of God and being made holy by him. Can't help but wonder, and this is maybe a, a thus think of the Randy, not thus saith the Lord, just something that, that's kind of tooling into my mind. Is this maybe a representation of the blood of Christ? Clearly, the next thing out, so here's that C that's there, but the next thing that would be beyond that. So I think artistically, this might not be accurate. It seems as I read it uh, that the law, uh, the, excuse me. Sorry about that. <laughs> I am jet lagged and my throat is still tired. Uh, we just made an international move back uh, from Italy back to the U.S. And I am still trying to get over the jet lag. So uh, bear with me a little bit. Thank you again for hanging in. Uh, the sea, I think, was really between the, the temple building and then the sea and then the altar. Uh, so I, I think this may be off just a little bit. However, here's the thing. Revelation 5, we get the next piece and that's the altar. Uh, that's where we see uh, the lamb who was slain. He is the one who makes the access point possible for us to enter in, not just into the holy place, but into the holy of holies. And so there is so much of this temple imagery that's being played out in Revelation 4 and 5. The next thing that we see uh, in Revelation 4 is the divine court. 
uh, we see the four living creatures and the 24 elders. Uh, before we uh, really get into them, let's talk about two key realities about heaven that we see so far. Number one, the focal point of heaven is always God on his throne. And we'll do uh, in that part two video, we'll do a comparison of some of the other visions of heaven. And what we see is that God on his throne is always the focal point. Second, heaven is fundamentally a place of worship. Uh, it, it, we, we see the temple imagery, the place of uh, the most sacred worship, uh, and we see uh, five hymns that are mentioned in Revelation chapters four and five. And throughout the book of Revelation, it is just filled with uh, worship and filled with these re uh, recordings of these hymns uh, that we see going on in heaven. So let's talk about these others that we see in Revelation four. Uh, the first group that is mentioned is the 24 elders. So this is in the order of the mention in Revelation 4, not in the order of position to the throne, because what we really see is God on his throne, the four living creatures around the throne, and then around that would have been the 24 elders. So this is kind of that moving from the outside inward uh, perspective. Verse 4, around the throne were 24, el uh, 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. And whenever the four living uh, the creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God. Uh, if you've ever heard that uh, expression, casting crowns, um, that's where that comes from. So that, that, that imagery of just that hu humility and worship, that all of my rank and authority and personhood I lay before you uh, because you are worthy of all that I am. Um, so let's talk about who these 24 elders are. This has been one of those points of uh, confusion and debate. Uh, and really, there's some different ideas and theories that are out there. Uh, and so here are just some of the, the most common ones that I see. Uh, number one, uh, that the 24 represents the 12 patriarchs, so uh, the 12 sons of Israel or the 12 tribes of Israel, and it also represents the 12 apostles. Obviously not um, uh, Judas, but probably Matthias. And by the way, he was the rightful successor there. So not Paul uh, in that case, could be. Uh, you can argue with me, I guess, in the comments, that's okay. Uh, I'm not gonna respond, uh, but you can let me know. Uh, and so that's one, is the 12 patriarchs and the 12 apostles. Uh, the other kind of broadens that. So we have these uh, Old Testament patriarchs and specifically the 12 New Testament apostles. Uh, so a literal 24 uh, number there. Uh, and then we also have uh, kind of that broader symbolic view of that it represents both the Old Testament and the New Testament saints. So really the totality of the people of God in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant all uh, kind of surrounding the throne there. The third is that it's just an ideal, idealized view of the church. So these are the followers of Jesus who are there, because this is part of the promise of Jesus that you will rule with me uh, on thrones. Um, and so there's maybe some biblical foundation to that. And, and let me just say there, you know, with all the ideas, I think that in every one of them, there's going to be a little bit of guesswork uh, in and who we are. There's a bit of speculation because we're not specifically told who they are. Any of the things that we land on are still going to be speculative. Some of them are going to be better founded by scripture than others, but because we're not specifically told who they are, we don't truly 100% know who they are. So just, you know, hold on that you don't have to have this 100% um, uh, reliable or accuracy uh, on on this or this um, uh, confidence level on, on that. It's okay to say this could be it uh, because scripture has not specifically told us who it is. Uh, the final idea is that it's the uh, some other angelic beings because uh, certainly all that we're seeing so far uh, have been angelic beings around the throne. And that so this could be just another category of angelic beings who also have some level of authority uh, within heaven. Uh, but you can let me know who you think they are. Um, honestly, I don't have a firm uh, view on this. I kind of lean toward it's the 12 patriarchs and the, the 12 apostles. But, you know, if you twisted my arm hard enough, I might be able to go uh, another direction on that. It is interesting to me, though, that if it is the 12 apostles, 
that John doesn't really mention that he recognized any of them. I mean, these are the guys that he lived with uh, for three years and he's been ministering with uh, for many years since then. And, uh, you know, he doesn't point out that, oh, there's Peter and there's my brother James and uh, yo, Thomas, you know. And and, and so uh, it would have also been kind of interesting that if it is, uh, did he see his own face? And that would have been uh, kind of an odd, surreal moment, I think, for John. But that it, it, if it is, they were at least obscured enough maybe that John could not make it out uh, or John had his own, his back to John. So kind of one of those sci-fi movie moments there that, you know, you can let your mind run with. Uh, but here's what we do know for sure. Number one, they are holy. Uh, They're described as wearing white garments. So these are definitely um, individuals who are part of their uh, key descriptor is that they are holy. Uh, they exercise authority. We see this in that they're sitting on thrones. Those thrones are in close proximity to the throne and that they also wear crowns. Now, the crowns that are mentioned here, interestingly, there's two different words in the Greek for crowns. One is diadem. This is a royal uh, crown, uh, crown of authority. Um, the other is a stephanos, a victor's crown. And that's the word that's used here. Uh, so that's kind of interesting that uh, they have somehow come through victorious on something, which may kind of lean toward this interpretation that they are indeed human. So um, I think that that's uh, maybe a clue there, but I don't know that for certain. Um, what is interesting is that they're always mentioned in conjunction with the four living creatures. Um, the one exception to that is chapter 11, verse 16. So they have a very close relationship to the four living creatures, and they are constantly either initiating worship or they're joining in. So we see the four living creatures and the 24 elders are oftentimes initiating worship. They're not the only ones that initiate worship, uh, but they are the main ones who do. And so one of those two groups is typically initiating worship in heaven. And now here's another cool thing. They keep our prayer before God. Uh, Revelation 5, 8 is where we see this. The 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Um, and going back to the, the temple imagery in that holy place, uh, we see the the item the right there in front of the priest that is there. That's the altar of incense, which represented the prayers of the people. So here is just another subtle way that we have this temple imagery that is uh, being included here. Now, I may be reaching, uh, but the, the table of showbread, the table of presents, uh, as it was also called, uh, had on it 12 loaves of bread that were presumably there, not presumably, they were there to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And it also represented the fellowship that Israel has with, uh, with God. We now have this 12 and 12, the 24. So could this kind of be, uh, in part, some of that representation there of uh, the 24 elders with the 12 and the 12 uh, on the table of showbread and their function of always keeping our prayers before God? I don't know. Again, that's a thus think of the Randy, not a thus saith the Lord. So you can... Tease that out in the comments uh, if you'd like. Uh, but here is just a pastoral point. Never, ever, ever give up on your prayers. Uh, let me go back. Uh, these are the prayers of the saints that they are holding. You know, sometimes it feels like our prayers are just kind of bouncing off the ceiling, uh, like we're not being heard. And, you know, it, 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 it's, it's one of those things that sometimes we can think, maybe God isn't answering my prayer. God always answers our prayer. Uh, he usually answers in one of three ways. Yes, absolutely. Here it is. He can also answer no, because it's in our best interest sometimes not to have the things we ask for. Uh, it'd be like a little kid asking for a flamethrower and not that my son asked for that for Christmas three years in a row. Uh, and the answer from Santa Claus and from dad was always no, <laughs> uh, because I love him and I love my family. And, and, and so sometimes a loving father will say no. And the third reason is, or third answer is not yet, that the timing is not there. And I think that some of these prayers that are being held are being held for the very end. We're going to see these come into play again in Revelation chapter eight. And I think the prayers that we're seeing there are some of those prayers of when will you deal with evil in the world? When will you deal with the wickedness in the world? And some of those are being held before God until the appropriate time. So never give up on prayer. Your prayers are being heard by God and they're being held before God always. By the way, we do not pray to the 24 elders. They're not 
collecting our prayers and putting it in there because we mention it to them. We're always praying directly to God because the precious blood of Jesus has blazed the way for us to boldly enter into the throne room of grace. We are never, ever commanded to pray to any dead human or any angels anywhere. In fact, we're told not to worship uh, you know, anyone but God. So let's be careful about that. The second major group that we see are these four living creatures. And what an interesting group this is. Uh, so here's the description we see starting in verse 6. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature, like a lion. The second living creature, like an ox. The third living creature, with the face of a man. And the fourth living creature, like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy. This is not the first encounter with uh, the four living creatures. We see these also in Isaiah chapter 6 and Ezekiel chapter 1. Uh, and, and so uh, they, they are really interesting in the angelic realm. Um, not every angel looks like a human being. Um, or vice versa. <laughs> uh, and, and these have really unusual characteristics. Uh, number one, the creepy fe uh, feature is they have, they're full of eyes all around. Um, and, and I don't know that they literally look like that, but this is the imagery that is given to John to convey something. They have great knowledge and wisdom. They, they're seeing everything. They have this knowledge and wisdom um, that is uh, profound. Uh, and this is going to be repeated again, because I, I think John was like, wow, look at all those eyes. You know, <laughs> I mean, it, 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 when, when we encounter someone with eyes are just not quite parallel, like they should be, it kind of sets us off a little bit. And to have a creature with these eyes all around, uh, would have been off putting, um, you know, in a, in a significant way, not that, and I'm not saying that John was just having this queasy experience. I'm just saying that, that John was seeing something very, uh, profound in who they are there. And, you know, I could be wrong. They could literally have eyeballs all around them, uh, which would make them a little bit hard to look at initially um, if we're able to do that. And I think we would be. Uh, they're described as having six wings. Uh, two, they fly. Two, they cover themselves. Um, uh, and I forget what the other two were. <laughs> like I said, I'm jet lagged. Um, and, and this is just like in Isaiah chapter six, not every angel has two wings. In fact, many of the angel or angelic encounters, there are no wings. They look just like human beings uh, in scripture. So don't get too locked into um, two wings and halos. Um, that's artistic. Uh, it's maybe fictional and mythological, uh, but that's not biblical. Biblical is you have some angels, some angelic creatures that have six wings. Um, they have an appearance like a lion, an ox, or a bull, uh, an eagle, and a man. And is in Ezekiel, it's kind of interesting because all four of them have all four of these faces. So this could be a thing where maybe John's perspective was he could only see one face at a time, or this is the way that they're manifesting, um, that they only have the one in that uh, moment to really convey uh, something significant about who they are. Um, and, and so, you know, don't get too locked into you know, they've got to have the four faces all the time or something like that. These are spiritual beings. Um, they're not locked in form like we are. Um, and so there could be that aspect where they could, uh, their form could be uh, a little bit mutable, changeable. Um, but the, 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 the reason perhaps, um, and, and the, some Jewish scholars and New Testament scholars have said um, that these kind of represent the strongest of the strong. Uh, the lion is the strongest of the wild animals. The ox is the strongest of the domesticated animals. The eagle is the strongest of the flying creatures, flying birds, and man is the strongest of them all. So I think one of the key things that is being um, shown in addition to their wisdom and knowledge is their strength. These are very, very powerful beings. Um, they are also the ones that are going to be involved in setting in motion the first four seals. So when we get to Revelation chapter six and the scroll seals are being opened, they are going to be uh, the agents responsible for setting those judgments in motion. And then when we get over to the bowls of wrath, uh, they are, th these four living creatures are going to be involved in handing the bowls of wrath to the angels. So we see them as agents of judgment uh, in Revelation. Uh, they also seem to function as throne guardians and worship leaders. Uh, so they're, they're those throne guardians around the throne of God. Uh, and as the ones that are closest to God, 
These are the ones who are leading in worship. Now, one of the big questions that we need to ask is not just what the content of Revelation 4 is, is why is it right here? Uh, because it's, it's messaging something theologically important just in its location. Why did John have this vision at this moment? Uh, and I think uh, before we go on, just a reminder, if you've gotten anything good uh, out of this, something to think about, uh, please give it a like and subscribe. This lets uh, YouTube know that it's a value to others as well. Uh, but I think here's the key thing. Revelation is about to show some events that are going to be intense, where evil will seem to be prevailing. And we need to remember God is on the throne. So before we get into all the craziness that's going to happen, the chaos and the catastrophe that is about to come, where it seems like um, the world powers are just uh, taking over, they're killing Christians, they're persecuting Christians, uh, that we need to be reminded God is on his throne. And so before we enter into this dark space or any dark space in our life, we're given these encouraging reminders. And it's kind of fun because the reminders come through worship, not just the imagery that we see in heaven, not just the uh, the, the glimpse of God on, the th on his throne and the angels all around, but the worship communicates a lot. Worship is very important in the book of Revelation. So when you're reading through, don't just uh, scan through the worship sections like, oh yeah, 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 they, they praise God. Take time to meditate on that because there's theological messaging that comes in uh, through the worship. It, worship is used to explain things. It's used to reveal reality. Worship uh, at its heart is not simply an emotional response to God. Uh, worship at the heart of it is based in theological reality, theological truth. You cannot truly worship God if you're not speaking truth about God. Um, I can uh, describe my wife in a way that is not uh, at all like her, and that would not be complimentary to her. Uh, I compliment her because of who she is, uh, not because of uh, the fictional things that I come up uh, with about her. In the same way with worship, it's not about things that we want God to be like. It's based on who God really is. We may do another little section on worship in the book of Revelation because it's good. Here's the first of the five hymns that are mentioned. There's two in Revelation chapter four, three in Revelation chapter five. The first one is um, what a lot of people know and recognize is that holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Uh, so three key things that come out in this. Number one, God is supremely holy. There is nothing not holy in him. He is the holiest of all. Uh, by the way, this is not an attribution to each person of the Trinity. This is a, a, a Middle Eastern way, a Jewish way of elevating to the highest level. If you want to say uh, something is uh, good, better, best, uh, you would just simply say instead of better, you'd say it's good, good. If you wanted to say it's best, you'd say it's good, good, good. If you want to say that God is the holiest of all, you say holy, holy, holy. Uh, so God is the holiest of all. Number two, he is almighty. He is the Lord God Almighty, which is a common title for God throughout the Old Testament. There is no one greater than him. And, th and third, he is eternal. He is the self-existent one, the one who's going to outlast uh, uh, everything. And this is a significant message going into the rest of Revelation. And so number one, we see that God is on the throne. He alone is in charge, even if it appears that evil is winning. Uh, as we go into this election season, we need to remember that. Amen. <laughs> Second hymn is this worthy hymn. And this is the 24 elders that are now initiating that one. The four living creatures, uh, we're doing the holy, holy, holy. Now the 24 elders contribute and they have this one, that worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. And by your will, they existed and were created. There's a lot in this, but the most foundational thing is he is Lord, he's the one who's in control, and he is creator. There's nothing that exists that did not come by God's hand. Doesn't mean by it's now existing in the way that God originally intended. We have that ability to really mess things up, uh, but he is the creator of all things. If he can speak something into existence, he can speak things out of existence. So God is all powerful. 
Uh, he is the creator of all things. Remember, when he created, he didn't have to get his hands dirty. He just spoke and it happened. Nothing is more powerful than him and nothing can remove him from the throne. Nothing. Um, number three, he is holy. All that he's about to do or allow to be done is good and right. And we can trust him. His holiness is a great source of confidence and trust that we can have that everything that is going to happen and it, it's going to be difficult and it's going to be dark, but all of it is coming to a good end that God has determined and that God will bring about and we can trust him. Even when it's painful, even when it's costly, we can trust him. Uh, notice this holiness aspect. And, and I want to come back to this. Heaven is fundamentally, foundationally, a place of worship. This other glimpse, uh, this initial glimpse that we get of the four living creatures, Isaiah chapter six, and the year that King Uzziah died. By the way, that is a time of political upheaval. It is a time of political chaos. Uh, it is change that is happening. And in the midst of that, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. Remember, God on the throne is always a focal point of heaven. High and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. Two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. That was the other. <laughs> um, and one called to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. A little bit different on the, the wording of this chorus here, but still fundamentally the same. And this Lord of hosts, he is Lord of the angel armies. There is no one greater in authority than him. This is one of the most common expressions of God's name in the entire Old Testament. And what's amazing, these four living creatures, there's about an 800 plus year gap between Isaiah 6 and Revelation 4. And those closest to God have never, ever gotten over his holiness. Wow. <laughs> you know, if you've ever been around just an amazing smell, you know, fresh baked bread or something like that, if you stick around that for a while, you kind of get nose blind. Um, and, and with this, they never get wholly blind. This is the most glorious aspect of God, and they've never stopped singing this song about him. May we never lose sight of that. Um, the, he is worthy. This is the fourth thing. Uh, he's not only worthy of our words, but he's worthy of our lives. Uh, he is worth whatever it may be, whatever it may be cost uh, to be named as his. This is important because when we get to Revelation 13, very clearly, the beast kills Christians. That antichrist spirit kills Christians throughout all the centuries from the moment of the ascension all the way through now until the end when it really ramps, ramps up, he's worthy. He's worthy of it costing our jobs. It's worthy of costing our friendships, of our family, of our income, of our reputation. He is worthy. He's worthy of our time. He's worthy of our service. Uh, and this is what the second song in heaven is singing about is his worthiness. He's worthy of all these things uh, because he is the creator, because he is in control, because he is holy and right and good. Uh, he is worthy. So let's serve him well. May our lives be lived in a way um, that is worthy of him. Uh, so this is just kind of the quick look. We'll have, uh, again, uh, a part two on this where we'll look at a couple of other elements and maybe a part three uh, on that rapture question of does the rapture happen in Revelation chapter four? Uh, thanks for watching. And again, if you got anything out of this, I hope that you'll give it a thumbs up. Hope that you'll uh, subscribe and follow for more. Love to hear your comments and thoughts below. Uh, and uh, again, thank you very much. Uh, I'm honored and it means a lot. Until we see you next time, may the Lord bless and Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen.